you've been through church membership already, uh, you've, um, you know, you ca- we've covered a lot of this. It takes a little bit of time to go over what I think is some of the most important things that, you know, we as a church communicate uh, on a regular basis, and it's really our doctrine, is really what we've been looking at for the last um, three weeks. And let me pray for us and get our minds on this, and then we'll, we'll go from there. Father, thank you for an amazing uh, weekend that we've, an even week that we're in the middle of, and um, pray right now that you would direct the, um, the time that we have together as those who are interested in, in church membership here at Grace Lighthouse Church, and pray that you will direct uh, every aspect of this time together for the few minutes that we have so that uh, people are more acquainted with uh, the membership aspects of, of this body and this fellowship, all for your glory, and we thank you for your, uh, all the ways that you provide, Lord, for uh, understanding in the scripture so that we're not taken off guard or, or taken by surprise and how this is meant to be understood and not just some information that only a few people in leadership know and the rest of the people know don't really understand it, Lord. We want this to be a cohesive understanding church-wide, and we pray for that now in Jesus' name, amen. All right, so if you have your packet, which is not that one, um, this, it was a, the, the very first thing that you opened up in your blue folder, and we have on the first two pages why church membership is important, and I believe the, you know, the overall understanding that church membership, you may not see, you know, you need to become a church member of a local church, but it seems to indicate that in the early church that there were criteria and there were uh, people keeping track because when they, uh, when the book of Acts mentions that there were 3,000 added that day to the church, it means that somebody was keeping track. Um, And there's other indications about how do you treat insiders and outsiders. Outsiders really are people who aren't part of the fellowship. They may bump in, into us here. They may come in here for a little while. They may leave. They, you know, maybe those who are looking understand what does, what does this church teach versus the one down the street. But they're not really with us. They're kind of, they might, you know, they look like the rest of us, right? They, wear, they have two legs and they walk in here and you know, they wear clothing and they have hair, or maybe not, um, but then they walk out of here. And, and they, we don't really know if they're a believer. We're glad that they came. We would love for them to understand more, certainly get saved and know Jesus. But it's, you know, we, but when you have people that are regular attenders of a church, um, they are part of that local fellowship. And there is, I believe, a clear um, ways that you sh- we should specify how do people become part of Grace Lighthouse Church so it's not misunderstood. I mean, I've had people f- first day that they visit us. I want to be a member. Well, we don't know you. Just get to know us for a while. We don't want anybody to really become a member unless they've been attending for about six months. You know, because they you know they may be really happy that they came and we may get a good feeling. But if they don't come back for another three months and then they still want to be a member, well, they didn't demonstrate any degree of faithfulness, any degree of getting to know us. Um, and so, again, it's one of those things that I think, you know, uh, you know we, we try to be flexible. If somebody's coming out of a church, say they moved in the area and they're looking for a Bible-believing church and they seem to be on board and, you know, they're already walking with their Bible and we know that they've got a family that's walking with the Lord— you know, should we make them wait six months? Uh, maybe not. Maybe we have a little bit of a grace on them. And I think that, that, that that's actually written in our Constitution that the uh, leadership can make decisions based on you know, the, you know, what we've discovered about a certain situation or family. But So last week, that was the first two pages. Last week we got through more of what we believe and teach. We, for the first week we talked about God, salvation, the Bible, the church, which we really have been talking a lot about lately, I'm going to talk about that this morning in my, in my message, talked about spiritual gifts within the body of Christ. Uh, I believe that spiritual gifts are present in the church. They're meant to be used. A lot of them, I think, when it trickles down into the congregation, a lot of it are things like generosity, serving, uh, people want to help. They want to serve Jesus. Yesterday was a perfect example of, you know, some people had, you know, very important tasks. They sat at a table. They managed a bounce house. They were willing to be there for the duration. 
um, a smile, a kindness, a, you know, all the things that goes with that. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm glad to be a part of this, you know, a, do it with a cheerful attitude. You know, th- those, I believe that's an aspect of spiritual gifting, where you have the gift of hospitality or the gift of service. You just don't mind. I, Pastor, I don't mind being one of the people that cleans up the church when everybody else is gone. It's actually a delight to me. I get to walk around this place and sing to Jesus, and I want to do that. And nobody needs to know. If people see me cleaning, great. But I'm not here to be seen. So I believe that is spiritual gifting. They're, they've got the bigger perspective of why they do what they do, and they want to be included, in su- whether they think it's a, a small role. There's the gifts of administration. You've got people on our leadership board, Paul Andrews and others who just do a, tr- re- Deirdre, who do a remarkable job with keeping things like coordinated and information that gets to our leadership. That is not a task. I remember asking somebody to collate a bunch of packets of papers for me and just in a rush job a few years ago. I'm like, hey, can you put all these together? And by the end of it, and I will never, I love this person, every packet was different. There was no order to the packets. I realized this person does not have the gift of administration. You know, we learned from that, and we have to be, you know, just be flexible and even laugh about it. But sometimes we try to fit people into areas of ministry that they're really not called, they're not gifted, their mind doesn't think in those terms. Some people just absolutely thrive in the area of administration. And they take great delight when they um, make life easier for people. Chris Taves, for example, he says, if I can come up with a technology solution for the church that makes everybody understand where we're going, what we're doing, how they log on, and I can help that, it's like this guy gets, takes pleasure in that. And so to me, that's spiritual gifting. That's like God working through somebody who could charge gazillions of dollars you know, in the real world, but it says, it's my privilege to get to offer this to the church body so that the Dollies of the world and the Cokas of the world and the Steves of the world, the two Steves of the world, um, that's supposed to be funny because there's two Steves here, they all get to see the same text message. But you give that to me, like, oh, pastor, go figure out what the best text app is for the church. You're asking the wrong guy. I could pick the one that's too expensive and dysfunctional and don't know how to test if it's a proven thing. But when you have people who have that gifting, you want to use that. So that's a little bit. And again, there's certainly other, you know, the gift of teaching. You got people who lead Bible studies, the Aaron Goldblatt's, Trevor, um, you know, at this time, not right now, but in the past, Trevor, you know, has a desire to teach. And so when you have the desire to teach, you usually have an ability to understand information and then try to present it in a way that the rest of the church can understand and appreciate. We talked a little bit about last week about divisions in the church. These are things that really cause problems. This is when people lose sight of why they're even doing what they're doing. And, and sometimes we have to realize, we, you know, I really believe that one of the requirements for leaders is to somewhat have a tough skin uh, because you can get, uh, I, I, rub in, I run into things in the life of the church that can affect me. And if, if I let it go too far, it's like you can like it emotionally can send you in a bad direction. And you're, you're dwelling on it. A spiritual leader has to have a level of toughness so that when I when somebody says something to me that is offensive, I have to be you know slow to speak, quick to listen. The flesh is telling me to react to that. Do you realize that 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 flesh nature wants you to go off? It wants you to win. It doesn't want to be defeated. It wants to win. It wants, to, it wants you to be right and them to be wrong. But in the body of Christ, that can't operate. That will always lead to some other problem and division. And that's when we stress with church membership. It's like, listen, you're buying into this understanding. You're recognizing that we didn't just cover this for no other sense. Like, oh, you get the packets of information and now you're a member. I want you to understand it. I want you to realize, listen, we're with you. We're going to work through that together. If there are challenges that we have to face as a church body, we're going to do it together. We have the resources through the Holy Spirit, through God himself, through his word of how to run a church. And he has not left us. He knows the mess we're in. (laughs) You realize that? Jesus knows the mess that we're up against. But he didn't, as he said, I did not leave you as orphans. You know, I did not leave you comfortless. I'm going to teach you, but we have to be willing to be taught. We don't have it all figured out. 
Um, and that's the other thing is, you know, humility is key in a church. Um, so divisions, we talked a little bit about that last week. And finally, may, get, may have gotten to a little bit of this one that I want to talk about. Um, and some of these overlap each other, so you get to know us a little bit more. Um, prayer, we as a church give you know, a lot of emphasis on praying for one another. We have prayer meetings. We take prayer requests. People who can't be here on Thursday nights, I might still get a prayer request from them. And we pray for them. And then I try to go back, or hopefully we'll get an update. Thank you so much for praying. Oh my goodness. I can't even tell you like, how that situation worked out. And we like give God the glory because your church body prayed for you prayed for your situation because prayer is a powerful weapon it's in, i mean it, it's 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 really how we um we avail ourselves i think i think that's the better word because james talks about that the prayer of a righteous person availeth much right you as a person in christ filled with the holy spirit walking in the spirit and yet you're praying for somebody you've got wisdom maybe about their situation as you listen to their prayer request and you might even say, you know what, I've been in the exact same situation, and let's pray together. Let's ask God to bring a solution for you, as he did for me. So we do that. Sometimes we do that one-on-one. -on -one. The care team, which is sort of this invisible ministry of the church, nobody really knows who they all are, but some people are part of the care team, and they send out cards, they connect, they offer rides to people who can't get to a medical appointment without a ride. But we don't really advertise them, but we try to find the people that could best fit into that ministry. And there might be people here who are already part of that. And maybe you've got a desire, like, I would really love to know that people could call on me when they have a need for a meal. Or, and we, could, you know, we, we already have a lot of that you know, operating. Um, and so, but those are areas that I think beyond the way that the prayer, the prayer of the church works, the care team works, uh, it's, it becomes a way that we as, and there, there are actually people right now dedicated in the church that take the prayer list and they focus on that beyond just the Thursday night. Or I say to somebody, listen, I'm dealing with a situation with a this, and it's delicate, it's tough, we're not exactly sure, we just need the Lord to help them, give us wisdom, would the four of you, without they, we, they may not even know all the details. We just maybe summarize it in generalities, just so it's, it's, you know, Lord, you know about the situation that pastor asked us to pray for or the deacons asked us to pray for, and we're asking you to work on behalf of that family. Help them, Lord. You know what, you know, you know what they need. You know what their, you know, whatever their specifics are. And, and then so over days, that family could be prayed for. Under, behind the scenes, under the radar, nobody knows about it. And I think that's awesome. You know, I think it's great. It's a great ministry of our church. So that's prayer on that handout part. So I said prayer is a powerful and necessary part of the Christian life. Believers are to seek a deeper relationship with God by talking to him, as well as seeking his blessing, direction, wisdom, comfort, and power to be most effective for him in ministry. That's what we want. We want to be effective for the Lord. Giving and serving. Scripture calls all Christians support to, to support the local church by giving both of themselves in service and of their financial resources. This is not to be done out of compulsion, guilt, or obligation, but out of sincere love for the Lord. Romans 12, uh, 1 Corinthians 16, 2 Corinthians 9, all talk about free will giving. Some people are struggling financially and they may not be able to give what you believe is the act, you know, what you classify as a biblical percentage. Um, we have to remember that if a person gives out of a generous heart, whether it's $2, $3, $500, whatever the amount is that they're able to give, God sees their heart, and I truly believe that he blesses that person, or he honors them. He may say, listen, I'm going to put you at the uh, shelf of the chicken, in Aldi at just the right time, and I'm gonna show you that all those five packages that everybody else would normally pay nine bucks, the lady just brought them all out and they're all been reduced because they're just about to go out of code and you've got the freezer at home and you can put them in your freezer and they're still fresh and you just save 50%. Do you see how God, like sometimes like we see provisions like that where 
Like, that was amazing. Like, the way that even our fundraiser worked out for the uh, church, all the people that Aaron Goldblatt shows up in, the ladies, like, kind of has a, you know, I don't know, Aaron might have gone out there crying, saying, we really need a bounce house. No, I, I doubt he did that. But, um, but, but he, he shared what we, you know, we wanted to use this, and she's like, just keep it. And the previous bounce house that the church owned, or thought we owned, um, was really more of a loner, and we had a slight misunderstanding, and not a big deal. Um, and but then, uh, you know, uh, two months later, we're being offered one that we don't have to worry about returning, and it was served a perfect feature. Anybody see the Wareham article, the newspaper article? Two kids, not even from our church, pictured in there. I'm like, that was a very nice photo. Um, so God takes care of us, and. You know, again, giving is never to be done out of guilt, obligation, browbeating. You know, the church shouldn't be begging people for money. They should give people the privilege to give to the Lord's work. And, you know, giving is, I think, one of those graces that God, for some people, he just really blesses them. It's like that's what they enjoy doing. And that's what they can do. There have been people who have helped support the life of this church that are able to do it and probably more significant than others and then over time it's like we couldn't have done what we're doing without that person's gift of giving god used yes i believe you know but ultimately god uses people to fund the church he he uses people the money just didn't fall out of the sky right um it it came through god's people and that and that becomes because people are seeing their need to be faithful in their giving, faithful in their tithing. They want to be. They, don't, they realize God's still going to love them even if they don't. God still can bless them even if they don't. But the joy that we get to do is really what we want to highlight as a church. We get to give to the Lord. We get to give to Him. Not we have to. We get to give to His work. Amen? Amen. And finally, missions. Okay, so this is a big part of what we as a church... Do our best to have others represent, at least support, believing in what they're doing in different parts of the world, whether it be Bible translation, whether it be college campus ministry, whether it be filmmaking, whether it be our friends, the Gregsons, who do all types of technology to uh, bring people, uh, the gospel, into places like Asia. I mean, creative devices like, you know, geniuses design. And, but they make sure that that design is used for the transmission of the gospel. And so, you know, how else? You know, remember what Jesus, uh, the, what Paul said in Romans, how beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news. And I think when your feet are working at a, you know, a counter where you're designing some piece of technology that your mind is thinking, oh my goodness, like if I do that and I program it this way and I go into this particular programming software and I realize at the end of the, at the, end of the day this little box is going to be used in mainland China to get the gospel to people. That's as good as if you went to China and were the missionary who could start a church. That's how God sees gifting. He see, God really sees the heart. You know, it's not so much the quantity of work and, you know, you know there's some people like, got to go to the mission field. I've got to go to the mission field. And they live their Christian life out of some sort of obligation and guilt. Like God's going to love you more if you have this more prominent place in the, in the ministry of the church. Not necessarily. Be faithful. Clean toilets unto Jesus. Right? I mean, if you do that and nobody else sees it, but the Lord saw that toilet getting cleaned and that thing never shined so much until you got in there. Like, to the glory of God, you know? I mean, we have to see ourselves as part of this wonderful ministry. Because when I go into a, a dirty, filthy bathroom, and I'm like, and this is supposed to represent the Lord? Like, that's not good, you know? So anyway, I'm not saying bathrooms shouldn't get filthy, and sometimes things happen, right? And I get over those things. I just say, you know what? we got to get the bathroom cleaned. But you guys are, this church has done a wonderful job of doing the, the, the ministries of this church and, and I, I, I just think we, but we can never, we need to be reacquainted with why we get to serve in the church. And, um, and so I'm sort of 
a little bit back and forth here. But so our church is supporting of, of missions. Um, we support Teen Challenge. We do our best to help Bloom. These are lo more local connections. We, we fund these. When, when Bloom comes in or Teen Challenge comes in, our leadership is agreed. We're, we're going to give them a gift if the church, the rest of the people, want to go buy a cutting board or just say, hey, I want to sp uh, sponsor a child. That's over and above what we've already committed to give them. 10% of every dollar. So if, if $500 came into the church today, this morning in the offering, 50 of it is assigned to missions. Every week, we get a chunk of money that goes directly to our missions fund. And then when I get a phone call from Steve Baldwin over this last week, and Steve's going to Egypt, he says, Pastor, I need money. I'm going to Egypt, and this is a great opportunity. If Grace Lighthouse Church can help me do the work I'm going to do in Egypt, can you guys help? I'm like, yeah, you know what, Steve? Because our people are faithful, and our church has structured the, the missions of the church to uh, receive funding after, uh, you know, not from the building fund, but when we take our plate-passing moment here in the church, 10% um, uh, of that is going directly to our missions fund and then we can pay missionaries or we can support missionaries. We can write a check. A lot of these, um, um, you know, these missionaries get an uh, uh, EFT deduction out of the church's bank account every month like that we've set up with an umbrella organization that does, that makes sure that they get the funds that we send over. So, you know, these are all things that the treasurer keeps track of and all of our givings accounted for. We know what's going out the door in terms of missions. That's why at the end of the year when you say, what did the church spend in missions? What did the church spend in building? What did the church spend um, in administration and salaries? We're, so you get to see, that's why members have a voice in this. That's why we as a church are, you know, we bring it full, you know, full circle. December's always the, you know, the time of the year that we move towards our annual meeting. And we're going to be getting ready for that. I can't even believe we're getting to the end of 2024. It's like, Wow. And, uh, but we're weeks away from our annual meeting, which will probably happen in, hopefully, I'd love to see it happen over there. Oh, that would be sweet. Wouldn't that be awesome? The new bill is sitting in the new building for the a December annual meeting. We're going to go for it. We'll hope, you know, keep you posted. I'm really hoping no, no matter what, we're there for Christmas Eve. So that will be sweet. All right. Keep praying. Keep praying. We just, as you pray, just pray that the Lord's timing would be perfect. All right. Finally here. Um, <clears throat> the rapture and future things is really where we want to talk about it's because a huge amount of the Bible, and I really want to say like th a third of your Bible is talking about the future. I mean, we live in this time, but it's all moving towards something. And God's not, uh, you know, God's not just like, uh, I'm just keeping you here. <laughs> you know, he's like, no, you're, I put you here to be used because ultimately you are going to be with me forever, and what you do here truly matters to him. And it was going to be amazing when we get to hear the Lord say, well done, my good and faithful servant. You know, And we're not getting there because of works, but we sure want to have a, uh, when we show up in front of Jesus, don't we want that to be something that we say, I did my best for the Lord. I overcame my own tendency to be selfish. My own this, my own that, all my excuses. I'm not saying we're ever really going to get there, but we sure want to work at thinking about our final destination. The rapture, I believe, Scripture says it could happen today. It could happen any day. It's not just a random thing. It's a completion thing. And it's really God doing his next big move. It's that the world is going to get so nasty over that period that we get to get pulled out of here. <laughs> that, that, that's just glorious. You think about that. That's a glorious expectation. Like, I don't have, yeah, it's kind of looking tribulation like right now. And like Israel's like, oh, it's a mess. That nation and all of that region is just seeming like we're heading into all out global conflict. And it's only a matter of time before I really believe it's going to happen. I don't know if we'll see the, to what escalation level it will get to before I believe the church is pulled out. But needless to say, we're here for now. And I really would love to see us in the building at least one day, and then the rapture could happen. But I, again, that's on the Lord's timing. I got to be in the building the other day on that property, so that was a sweet moment. All right, so yeah, believers should be looking for the blessed hope, the rapture of the church. This is when Jesus comes to take all who believe on him to be with him before the great tribulation. 
we teach the thousand-year reign of Christ coming upon the earth after the tribulation. The Lord Jesus is making all things new, and we will rule and reign with him for all eternity. Even so, come Lord Jesus, as the scripture says, when we see him, we will be like him. We will not be Jesus, but we will be as pure as he is. There's not one aspect of your life that won't be totally, completely made right. Every physical ailment, every challenge, every emotional challenge, mental challenge, it is all in an instant completely and totally made right. And you get a brand new body and you get to be with Jesus. Remember when they touched him? I, I want to like, unless I put my fingers in his side and you know, touch his hands, I will not believe him. And like here Jesus shows up in his glorified body, walks through a wall, kind of shows up in a room. That's what we're going to have. That's the body we get to have. Isn't that awesome? And we're just, wait, we're just kind of waiting. We're hanging out. <laughs> we're hanging out and waiting. We're in, uh, and I'm going to talk about that this morning in the message. But finally, we've got five minutes to cover that. So you guys should review that. This is what our church teaches, explained why. Oh, and I think there's, is there one more page on there, which I really want you all to fill out. And if you don't have one, I'll get you one. Um, this is your church membership application. I love reading these. These are so sweet. This is like when I hear, you know, I don't know Jacelyn's full testimony, but it's like, I was three years old and I asked Jesus to save me. She didn't write that. I'm just making this up. But it could be something like that. But I love reading that moment where somebody really believes, like, that's the day I became a Christian. I, I just hold on to that day. I really believe that Jesus died for me on the cross. So basically, it's your first and your last name. It was the last page in that packet. Describe briefly when you asked Jesus to save you. You don't have to write a book. I only provided five lines. Um, have you been baptized as a believer in Jesus Christ? Yes, year I was baptized, if you can remember. And if you don't, just say, some time ago. <laughs> But, um, and, or not yet. And so we, um, as you know, we just had, was it five people that were baptized, which was wonderful. And so fill that out, because we're not, you know, not even when you can give that to me, great. And, uh, you know, it's just one of those things that was attached to that portion of the, of the packet. The next one that I gave you, we're not even, I'm only going to introduce this for a moment. So we are calling this our foundations approach to christian growth some would use the word discipleship um, this really is the pathway into progress as a believer we are doing many of these things already as a church and i, I i'm just giving you an overview but we're going to get to this next week so hold on to it but just a quick overview i put the scriptural mandate and pattern um, under that heading grace lighthouse church intentional building which i think is timely equipping and spiritual development growth plan. So this is what we already, many of these things we're already doing, but we're looking at this more as a sequence of things that we would like to offer over the course of a year so that people are like, you know what, I need that really, I really need that new believers class. And then we can say, you know what, we offer the new believers class like twice a year, it's an eight week course, and it gets people acquainted with the basics of salvation. We've kind of covered some of the basics even you know, over these last three weeks. Um, and then I gave you several scriptures that really talk about why we're to do what's stated above. You'll see our brand or recently developed vision and mission statement. Um, those are the things that we worked on for weeks as a leadership. And I can just read those quickly. All of God's creation. What's our vision? All of God's creation knows and believes Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior through the power of the indwelling Holy Spirit. That's what we're committed to as a church. All that we do, whether we do a cornhole tournament to raise a little money, we really want everything we do ultimately with this as its, you know, kind of its marching orders. And our mission statement, Grace Lighthouse Church is committed to proclaiming the word of God, his grace and his love so that all will be a new creation in Jesus Christ for growth, development, and deployment in his church. So that's our vision and our mission. And then lastly, those four blue sections, I'll read those each and then we'll look at these next week. We want to talk about, you know, as first steps as a new Christian, laying the foundation, beginnings and basics, building the structure. In other words, grounding yourself in the word of God and then beginning to grow. Fortifying the structure. This is deepening and developing. You understand the church. You understand spiritual warfare. You, you understand expanding your Bible knowledge. You're sharing Christ in both word and deed. You're, you're a gracious witness for Jesus no matter where you go. You may not always speak, but you're kind and you look for opportunities. Completing the structure. I like this. Deployed and, and duplicating. 
Uh, understand your calling, gifting, you're teachable. You might even move into a teaching position. You can lead and be led, potential church leadership. Reproducing in ministry, you like to share Christ with others. Tested, mature, entrusted, a good reputation within and with outsiders. And you understand a right division of the word of God, 1 Timothy 2.15. Again, I'm going to devote more time to this, but this is yours. Uh, we spent a lot of time looking at this as a leadership, but I really believe this is going to probably take more prominent position when we're in the new building that we'll be talking about. What are next things that each of the uh, members of the church can be a part of, new attenders? And, um, but I think it's good that you as... Did you guys get this document? You did, okay. All right, let me pray for us, and thank you, everybody, for being here. We're going to keep going for a few more weeks, and uh, hopefully on the 14th, what is that date? Or the 13th of October, I'm going to welcome in those who want to be new members of Grace Lighthouse Church. Publicly, those would stand up with me, and we're going to pray for you and say, you know, look what God has done bringing these guys officially as part of this congregation. Heavenly Father, thank you for this opportunity, Lord, right now that we get to um, speak just speak about these important things and really understanding together what we're trying to do as a church. As for the days to come, Lord, it's just been so much fun, Lord, to uh, get to build with these just amazing people, Lord. And thank you for saving them, loving them, blessing them, helping them, making them part of this wonderful body of Christ, Lord. And we pray that each of us would be uh, really geared to protect the unity of the body, Lord, in everything we do and say. We love you and thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right.